Hi, I'm Vanessa. Thank you for checking out this message. This is the final installment of our Confessions of a Pastor series, and it's been so good. I hope you haven't missed a week in this series. For the latest information on how you can get involved and take your next steps at the journey, please check out our Journey mobile app. But now, let's jump into the message. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Very good to see you, even though I technically can't see you because of the lights, but I know you're out there. I hear you. It's good to have you here today in person, everybody who is online this morning. We are thankful that you are joining us as, uh, as we continue this series today. And as we, we do, I want to kind of take you back to where I grew up. I grew up in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, some people don't know where that is. It's on the western part of the state. Uh, Winston-Salem is known for three products. It is known for R.J. Reynolds tobacco. And so tobacco is a big product or used to be. Uh, back in the day, that was the headquarters. They actually would take you into the factory and you could watch them make cigarettes. And it was like this actually pretty kind of this amazing thing. But uh, known for tobacco. Um, it's known for Krispy Kreme donuts. Krispy Kreme donuts. Yep. They were uh, invented there. The headquarters are there. Um, they are the best glazed donuts out there, hands down. There are none better than that. And then lastly, this one's not going to make any sense at all to you. Texas Pete hot sauce is not from Texas. It's from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It was created there. They put the name Texas on there for some odd reason. I don't really know. You can go look up it in Wikipedia. But uh, kind of crazy, but that product is there too, okay? Three products, every single one of those will kill you, all right? So you just got to be careful when you're thinking about having any of those. But I grew up there. Uh, my family moved there, as my kids like to say, back in the 1900s. Um, it was the early or the late 1800s that my family moved there. My dad pastored at a church for 36 years before he retired about five years ago. My mom was a school teacher for 25, 26 years there locally. So that's, that's home to me. Uh, so if you kind of put all those things together, I'm a Southern boy, okay? That's my heritage, that's my past, that's my culture, that's my church background, that's everything to me. I'm a Southern boy because I grew up in that area. Well, as I was coming out of ministry or beginning my ministry career, finished my degree and was looking for a church to work at, to be a pastor, at a youth pastor, I wanted to stay in the South because I, I knew the South, right? I knew the culture, I knew the people, you know, I stay in the South somewhere that'll fit me perfectly. Uh, a couple churches uh, contacted me. One of them was in Houston, Texas, the deep South, right? And uh, so I flew down there one weekend to spend some time with them to get to know them. And uh, it was kind of strange as I was flying in, I looked down and I'm like, why do all these people have pools in their backyards? And then we landed and got out of there and walked outside the airport. And I'm like, now I understand why. It's like the hottest, most humid place I've ever been in my entire life. But I like the people and I thought, I kind of know them. I, I think I could, I could fit well here. There's another church that called me. They were in this far, far away land. It was a very different group of people. It was a strange group of people. They were kind of weird to me. They, they ate different foods than I did. And, and, and this faraway land was known as New Jersey, okay? And, uh, and anybody from New Jersey here, lived in New Jersey? Anybody in here? Yeah, a couple of people. All right, there we go. Uh, anybody online? If you're online, hit that heart button for us. We want to know that uh, you're from there. We loved it. We lived there seven years. I actually took the job there. We loved being there. But, but it was. It was so different. In fact, when I landed there for my weekend to try out, a pastor took me to this restaurant, local restaurant, and uh, we go inside. And, and the, the waitress puts the, the menu down in front of me. And I look at it, and the very top it says, tomato pies. I'm a southern boy. I know what pie is. There's never anything that's ever called tomato pie in the south, right? And so all these images are going through my mind, like, who would eat this kind of nasty junk? I mean, the pastor could tell I was kind of struggling. He's like, hey, Chad, it's pizza. I was like, oh, okay. And it was really good pizza, by the way. Uh, the waitress came up, and, you know, one of the first things that they ask you once they give you the menu is, what can I get you to drink? What's a good southern person say? Sweet tea. Coke's next. But sweet tea's first. Sweet tea. And I said, hey, I'd love to have some sweet tea. Put my head back down. She's like, uh, we have unsweet tea? There's sweetener there on the table. You can put that in your tea to sweeten it up if you'd like to do that. And I just said, bless your heart. I mean, it's... Because <laughs> she doesn't know, right? Southerners, we know. You, you, you put the... If you want to make really good sweet tea, which I don't drink anymore, by the way, but if you, if you do it, you, you actually brew the tea and you put the sugar in it as you're brewing it. And that's the way you should really make sweet tea. But that, that's what sweet tea is. And so I knew I was, I was in a different place. 
But again, I decided that was where that God had kind of called our family to go to. Well, as we, we got there, I began to also understand that what, what I thought I knew about the church was actually off quite a bit. Uh, I'd grown up in a church, maybe like a church like many of you, a generational church, uh, a, a church where you had many families, or really about four families, and everybody had the same last name, and they were kind of interconnected in some weird way. You couldn't quite pinpoint it, but, but everybody knew each other. This is a church that people had grown up in their whole lives. I mean, everything about it, it was, it was all the same, right? But these were people I loved because they knew me. They were connected to me, and they had influenced me, and they, they had gotten me to this place where I wanted to be in ministry because of, of these, these, these relationships that I had. But, but then there was this church in New Jersey, and the people there, they, they weren't family. They, they weren't connected. Now, they all had sort of the same endings to their last names with O's and A's and skis at the end. But other than that, they really weren't connected at all. They, and, and the crazy part was they were so new to their faith. I mean, this church was only four years old. Here, here are these people that, that are just kind of starting their faith journey and just met Jesus. And I'm like, hold up a second. I didn't know the church could do this. I didn't know the church existed for people that were far from God. I thought it existed for people like me who, who kind of grew up reading the Bible and understand the Bible and right living. I, I thought this was what the church was all about. And it totally blew my mind. And it really was the first time in my life, in my wife's life too, that we understood the church was for everyone. That, that it wasn't just for people who said they were Christians, but it was also for, for those who were far from God. And it was so liberating and free for me to understand that that's what the church was all about. But I still had the struggle that was there. And it's one that I still feel like I have today. And that leads us into the final week of our series called Confessions of a Pastor. Now, if you haven't been with us over the past few weeks, let me just kind of give you a real quick recap. In this series, I've just been making confessions about kind of these things I struggle with, these tensions in my life, and then maybe they connect with you too. And so the first week I said, I'm normal. I'm not a super Christian. I'm not a super pastor. I'm just a normal guy, and I'm just like everybody else, trying to follow Jesus in my life. And then the second week I talked about how I have doubts, that I have a strong faith, and yet I still, I still struggle with doubts. There's still things I read in Scripture I have questions about. There's still things happening in the world. I wonder where God is, but, but my faith is strong, and I'm asking those questions, trying to figure out what this looks like and, and, and where God can lead me in these doubts that are there. And, and then last week I, I said I, have, uh, I fear failure, that uh, it is a fear that I have, but, but how God's like, hey, I didn't give you that gift. I gave you these other gifts to love and to be disciplined and self-disciplined and, and, and to, to have this power that I'm giving you through my spirit. And, and you got to take these faith risks. But it's something that I continue to work on in my life. But, but this last one is a doozy. All right. And, uh, and you're going to fall on probably one of two ways here. You're going to disagree quite a bit or you're going to be like, man, I'm all in on this one. All right. So if you've got tomatoes that are rotten, please don't throw them today. Just listen. There's a nice little twist at the end. So I'm just going to go ahead and throw that out there, even though it shouldn't. Here's the deal. Here's confession number four. I don't like many Christians. Okay. I don't like many Christians. Now, let me just say this. I'm not talking about this church, okay? I'm talking Christians in general. I'm talking today about the church in general. I'm not specific here. Somebody will hear this and be like, man, that place is messed up. What's going on there? Those people are crazy. Well, it's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about in general today, okay? But I don't like many Christians. I struggle liking many Christians. Now, why am I at this point? Why is this tension that I feel? Well, well let me share with you some of those tensions that I have and where they come from. Uh, the first one is I find that many Christians are judgmental. In fact, they're some of the most judgmental people I've ever been around. There's the judgment versus the world, right? You know, as you look at the world around, you know, you, you find these Christians are offended by profanity that someone else uses. Or, you know, I can't believe they're living together. I can't believe they would wear that out in, in public. Uh, I can't believe their, their views. And I'm thinking, I'm pretty sure in Scripture it says we're not to judge the world. That's God's job to judge the world. And yet too many times we as Christians, Christians will start to judge the world around them. But there's a little deeper piece here. I find many times that Christians judge the church too. That it's not just the world that they look at and judge, it's the church also. Like you're reading the wrong translation. You know there's only one translation you're supposed to read from that. 
Or, or, or as we think about it, it's, uh, the music's too modern, the music's too loud, it's too blended, it's, it's, um, it's too old. Or, or one of my favorite, and I've shared this before, the church doesn't feed me. The church doesn't give me what, what I need. Or another favorite, um, my last church did fill in the blank because we were very transient here, right? My last church did this, and we loved that, and it was great, and I think this church should do it, and you guys don't do it, or you don't do it the same way. I mean, very judgmental of the church, and I don't even want to talk about the theology of mask this morning. But, um, but, but we find, or I find, that many Christians are so judgmental of the world, of the Christians, of the church, and I struggle with that. But, but I also find that many Christians are hypocritical. They say, hey, this is how you're supposed to live, and this is how they're actually living their lives. Like, like this is what it means to follow Jesus, and this is what a Christian does, and yet you, you watch their lives, and you think, but, but you're not living the same way that you're telling other people to live. What's, what's happening here? You're being hypocritical. Barna did some research uh, a little over 10 years ago looking at the habits of Christians versus non-Christians. What they found was, and let me just kind of define this Christian title for you. Um, and again, I've talked about this before. There's, there's people who say they're Christians and there's people who actually follow Jesus, okay? Um, sometimes that title, Christian, is a generational title. It's my family grew up Christian. I haven't been to church in my entire life, but I, you know, I say I'm a Christian or I go to a church on Christmas and Easter and, you know, I'm a Christian. So there's some definitions there and there's definitely people who are followers of Jesus, of course, who fall right into that, that name also. But, um, but, but Barna said, here's what they found in their studies. They found that only 2% more people who say they're Christian than non-Christians serve, like, like volunteer in any capacity. And when they looked at the giving of, of Christians and non-Christians, they found that non-Christians actually gave more to any kind of nonprofit than, than Christians did. Uh, the divorce rate, we've talked about this before. The divorce rate, if you look at people who say they're Christian versus non-Christians, it's, it's right about the same amount. It's right around that 50% mark. And so here's what we see. We see people say, hey, this is the way you're supposed to live your life. And yet we watch. And it's like, but you're not living your life the same way. I mean, not to mention, there's only one Christian restaurant to eat at, right? Chick-fil-A. And they're like, you should only go eat there. But then you go to Popeye's one day and that leader's in there getting a Popeye's chicken. Yep, you know how it is. Anyway, they say one thing and they act differently. And I struggle with that. Uh, another one is that many Christians have an us versus them mentality and Wow, this one's really kind of blown up in the last few years, the last few decades, where it's like Christians versus or us versus the world. And, and so there's this mentality out there, like everything's got to be Christian now. We've got to turn everything Christian. We're going to fight for this. We're going to have prayer in school. We're going to put up Ten Commandment monuments everywhere we can. We need Christian platforms and Christian parties and, and Christian politicians and a Christian nation. And so there's this battle that's there. It's us versus them. It even goes beyond that again. It's us versus us. Social media has just shown this to us in so many ways. And that someone will say something, write something about their faith and who they are, and people just kind of pile on. It's like, what are we doing? There are um, some Christian authors and pastors I follow on Twitter, and it's crazy to me. That someone will post something, and I don't always agree with what they post, but it's kind of thought-provoking, right? And you may have five people like, oh, I totally agree with you. Five people are like, can you... Can you discuss this with me a little bit? Can we have some dialogue? I'd like to understand a little bit more. And then there's like 300 people like, you're the devil, you're from Satan, you know, you're going to have all this stuff. It's like, where is this coming from? There's like this fighter mentality, us versus them and us versus us. And it's why I struggle liking many Christians. But then I have my own baggage too. Uh, again, I grew up a pastor's kid and um, when we moved to North Carolina, there was uh, this group of people, they just loved on our family. I mean, they were there for us when we got there. They were bringing us meals, and for, for a few years, it was like, wow, I feel like one of their kids. I feel like a, a grandkid, and they're bringing us Christmas presents and Halloween stuff and, you know, birthday stuff and just dropping food off. I'm like, this is amazing. But then a few years in, they're the people that are standing up in a meeting at church and like, we got to get rid of this pastor that's here we got to get rid of him because of the direction of this church and what's happening and the leadership. We, uh, this is not the way this is supposed to be. And, you know, the church was growing and new people were coming in and everybody was feeling uncomfortable with that. And, and we can't be uncomfortable. we got to stay tight-knit. And, and I'm thinking, you're the same people who told me that you are followers of Jesus, but I don't see you living that same life. And so I've got this baggage that I carry with me, too. 
And, and so for me, when, when I kind of put all this together, I'm like, man, this is, this is a reason that I struggle liking many Christians. And, and as, I, as I go through that, I also begin to understand why so many people leave the faith. And why so many people leave Jesus? And why so many people leave the church? Why would you want to be a part of something and a group of people who kind of fall into that judgmental and hypocritical and this fighter mentality? I mean, why would you do that? And yet we find this in our world all the time with people who say they follow Jesus are people who don't act anything like Jesus acted or Jesus called us to act. That's why I love these words from Romans. I'm going to spend our time today looking at a passage in Romans chapter 12, starting with verse 1. Paul writes, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Paul's writing these words to this group of Christians in, in, in Rome, and he's hoping that he's going to see them someday. And he basically takes this letter that he writes, and he's, he's telling them about the gospel. He, he's, he's trying to clear up some, some misconceptions that they have about him and about Jesus and the gospel. And so he's trying to put all this together. And in chapter 12 here, he tries to kind of wrap it all up in, in some ways. And, and he begins here at the very beginning. And look what he says. He says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. So he's adamant, right? He, he, he says, look, this is important. If you say you follow Jesus, here's the deal. Then you need to follow Jesus. Don't, don't do what's comfortable to you. Don't do what's easy for you. Don't do just whatever your neighbors are doing. He's like, if you're going to say you follow Jesus, then make sure that you are following Jesus. I plead with you to do that, to be that kind of example. And then he says this. He says, give your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice for this group there, many of them had a Jewish background, and so they would have understood this, this term sacrifice. Um, every year, if you were Jewish, uh, you would go to Jerusalem to the temple and you would sacrifice, so the priest would sacrifice for you a, a lamb or some doves. And, and that sacrifice was to forgive you for the, the past year and all the sins you had committed. So you were fresh, you were beginning anew for the year ahead. And so they understood this word sacrifice. But they're also followers of Jesus, so they understood sacrifice through, through what Jesus did for them. Jesus self-sacrificed on the cross. He could have said, no, no, God, I'm not doing this, but he didn't. He got on the cross. He, was, he allowed himself to be crucified, and, and so he gave of himself. Why? For forgiveness of sins, for, for salvation. But that this forgiveness wasn't just for a year past or a year forward. It, it, it was for our whole past, and it's for our whole future. And so they understand this term sacrifice. Here's Paul who jumps in here, and he says, hey, Give your bodies as this living and holy sacrifice. That means I'm not asking you to be done with life. I'm asking you to live this life. You're sacrificing all that you are to humanity, to the people around you, to the people you care about, the people you love, and even those you don't love, and even those you, you struggle with, and even those you may not like. Be a living sacrifice to them. Give of yourself. Then he says this in verse 2. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Ben Sixsmith wrote an article called The Sad Irony of Celebrity Pastors. And here's what he wrote. He said, I am not religious, so it's not my place to dictate to Christians what they should and should not believe. Still, if someone has a faith worth following, I, I feel that their beliefs should make me feel uncomfortable for not doing so. If they share 90% of my lifestyle and values, then there's nothing especially inspiring about them. And instead of making me want to become more like them, it looks very much as if they want to become more like me. What's the world tell us to do? The world says be judgmental, be hypocritical, be a fighter. This is where you should spend all your time and your attention and all of your efforts. And Paul's like, no. He says, follow Jesus. Be a living sacrifice in this world. This is how you are called to live. And, and he uses that word transform in there. And if you're familiar with that, it's the same as our, our word metamorphosis. 
Paul is like, you need to be changed into this new person. You need to, to have this new life. And, and for us, it begins on the inside. We become this follower of Christ and, and who we are on the inside, our heart and our soul, it totally changes. It's, it's transformed from who we were in the past. And then we begin to show that through the actions that we live out, not being hypocritical and judgmental and a fighter, but by loving people and caring for people, even when we disagree with them fully, even though, as Jesus says, we got to love our enemies, right? I'm like, that's who we're called to be. It's what Paul says who, who we are to be. And yet again, as I look around, I look at people who say they follow Jesus and are Christians, and I find we're living just like the world lives, and we're not living as Christ has called us to live, that we've not been fully transformed by Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean we have to be perfect because we're not, but it should mean that we're doing everything we can to fully follow Christ and not carbon copies of the world who just say well, I'm a Christian and yet our lives look just like the world we live in. As I kind of put all this stuff together, thinking through it, two things pop into my head uh, about it. One, I, I believe that for there are many people who say they're Christians, it's just a facade. It's a mask. It's something we hide behind. The, the, for instance, we may show up on a Sunday morning and life's great and wonderful and I'm a follower of Jesus and the other 167 hours of the week we live and act very differently than, than what we say we believe in, but we act and live very much like the world around us. I, I find sometimes that, that for many Christians, it's a facade that we, we have. And, and again, we're not asked to have a facade. We're, we're asked to be fully transformed. Our lives are called to be different. But then here's the bigger issue with all this. And one of the reasons I believe I struggle with liking many Christians, that's me. There's your twist. It's me. Because I begin to look around, I think to myself, these people are judgmental, they're hypocritical, they have this fighter mentality, and oh, guess who else can be judgmental and hypocritical and have this fighter mentality of us versus them or us versus us? I do. Because I'm no different than anyone else. I'm no different than many other Christians that I struggle with some of those same things. I have to try to catch myself and say, oh, Chad, are you, are you actually fully transformed by, by Jesus too? Or are you just a carbon copy of the world? Because I know that in my life, I struggle with this exact same thing. That I will look at other people and say, oh, I'm glad I'm not like them. I'm glad I'm living the life that I'm supposed to live, but... But Paul, Paul's great. Paul gives us some insights into that in verse 3. He says, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. All right, this is like really important stuff. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given you. And too many times, followers of Christ, people who say they follow Christ, Look at others and say, I'm glad I'm not like them. I'm glad I don't act like them. I'm glad I don't think like them. I'm glad I don't believe like them. And Paul's like, have you checked your own heart? Have you checked your own soul? Have you checked yourself? What's going on deep down in you? Because I think you would find that you think you're better than them. And here's the deal. Here's my warning. That's not the life that you're called to live. You're called to live in faith with God. You're called to follow Jesus fully. You're called to love those who are different than you, that, that are your enemies maybe in your mind. You're called to love them all. You're not called to judge them. That's why I love the kind of violent, really, imagery Jesus gives us in Matthew 7, 3-5. He, he says, as he's talking to these people, he's like, you're worried about this person over here. They've got a little speck in their eye, okay? <laughs> What's coming out of your eye? And, and the actual terms used here is rafter, all right? If we were to take that Greek and translate it as rafter. You've got this rafter that's stuck in your eyeball, all right? And you don't even know it's there. You don't even know it. You act like it's not there. And this person has a speck, and you're so focused on them. Jesus is like, have, have you ever looked at your own heart? Have, have you looked at your own soul? Have you looked at your own issues? Have you begun to work through those? Because <laughs> I hate to tell you. But what you're going through, what you're struggling with, what, the way you see yourself, it's a much bigger issue than that individual over there. Too many times we get caught up in comparing ourselves. And Paul's like, don't compare yourself. Jesus is like, don't 
Don't compare yourself. And then Paul says this in verse 4. He says, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. If you read some of Paul's letters, you'll find he uses this body imagery over and over again, which makes sense. It's easy for us to kind of see this, right? Because we see bodies all the time. And he talks about how our, our human bodies function, that you know, we have fingers and hands and arms and torsos and legs and feet and toes and eyes and ears and all this kind of stuff. And, and they all have to work together. That, that if they work together, we can easily get from point A to point B. If they're, they're not working together, it can be kind of tough to do the things that we would normally do. I uh, broke my, my pinky finger playing baseball one summer, high school. And uh, man, the pinky finger is pretty important to like tying shoes, uh, putting clothes on, belts on. Tie, I mean, it's pretty important. It may not seem like it, but when it's incapacitated, it totally changes things. Or for those of us, you know, as you get older, you wake up in the morning and you're like, I didn't know I had a body part right there and it hurts real bad, right? You know what I'm talking about? You know, crick in, in the, the neck, your lower back, you know, it hurts tremendously or you can't feel your right leg, which you probably should go to the hospital for. But anyway, you, you have these things, you're like, I, I can't really function today like I usually would because something's not working quite right. Our, our bodies are, are put together in such a way that we can function, that we can, we can be one body. And, and here's Paul who's saying, hey, Here's the deal. If you say you follow Jesus, if you're a Christian, you're all part of one body. And you know what that means? The judgmental, the hypocritical, the us versus us, the us versus them person, they're all part of this body too. The prayer warrior, the Bible answer guy, the, the servant who serves and volunteers every time they have a chance, guess what? We're all a part of the same body, the body of Christ. We may not think alike. We may have some different theologies. We may have some different ideas. But here's the deal. We're all part of one body. And we're called to love that body. And we're called to work together as one. Not to pick and choose who we want to like and who we want to love. We're called to fully work together. And so I think about that, and I think about what would happen if those of us who said we follow Jesus, if those of us who just even claimed that title, Christian, if we began to actually live that out, and we began to engage our, our neighbors and our coworkers and family members that were far from God, what would happen if we began to fully do that? What would happen if people who said they were Christians were more generous with their money? When it came to the church and it came to nonprofits and it came to those in need, what would happen to, to poverty? What would happen to, to communities if, if we fully engaged with that? What would happen if we spent more time doing good in our world and less time being judgmental and hypocritical and, and in these battles with each other and with others? What would happen to our world I can tell you what would happen. Our world would be a much better place to live. We, we like to say it's their fault and it's them and they did this and that's why we're here. I'm, th I'm here to say, look, if you say you're a Christian, you say you're a follower of Jesus, begin to be transformed by Jesus and then watch our world be changed because of that. Uh, we don't have to try to put people in places of power and fix things and put the Ten Commandments out there. No, we can just live our life like we've been called to live it. We could fully follow Jesus. And, and if we did that, our world would be so much different more and more people would be taking their steps with Jesus instead of taking steps away from Jesus if we live that out in our life. How do we do this? Well, let me just kind of give you three ideas that I think are important. Here's the first one, follow Jesus. I mean, it sounds simple and hard at the same time. Follow Jesus. And for some, I mean, you are... You're following Jesus. You've been transformed, and you're trying to live this out. And, and you know it's not easy, right? But keep following Jesus. Just because you think you may have got there, you didn't get there, okay? There's no gold star at the top that says you're done. You've, you've completed all the tasks. We're always learning to follow Jesus better and better in our life. Let that transformation continue to be a part of who you are. And then maybe for others, you're, you're kind of in the middle. You're like, hey, I want to follow Jesus, but I still like some of the world stuff. Here's what I would tell you to do. Let that transformation actually happen in you. Let God work in you. Let Jesus work in your soul. Because you, you can't do both. You, you can't say, hey, I'm a Christian, but I'm just going to take all these things I like about Christianity and do them. But these things I don't like, I'm not going to do. 
because the views are different, the theology is different. I'm not going to do that. No, don't do that. Fully follow Jesus and see what happens as you're transformed. And then maybe for others, you're at the beginning stage. You're kind of taking those first steps or you want to. You want Jesus to be the leader of your life. Let Jesus be the leader of your life. Be all in. Let, let us have that conversation with you. Let's talk about baptism. Let's talk about taking your first steps to follow Christ because your life will be better for it if you truly want to take those steps. But I would say begin by following Jesus. Second thing I would tell us to do is to work together instead of ripping each other apart. Can we stop fighting? Like just because somebody posts something on social media doesn't mean you have to respond to it, all right? It's the worst thing we can do. And I, again, I, I can tell you that there are many times I've been tempted to do that, but I play it out in my mind. I'm like, what good's going to come out of this? A battle's going to begin, a fight's going to happen, and nobody's mind will ever change, and now we're going to hate each other. Why do we want to get to that place? Oh, just let it go. That's their opinion and their thought. If you disagree with them because of theology, just pray for them. I mean, keep praying for them. And maybe you'll have opportunities in a face-to-face -face conversation of like, hey, help me understand where you're coming from here. Instead of, hey, I'm going to rip you apart because I totally disagree with you. I can tell you that many people leave the faith, they leave the church, they leave Jesus because of what they're seeing on social media. Stop fighting. Let's stop ripping each other apart. Let's learn to do what Jesus asked us to do. Jesus said, love your enemies. And sometimes it might be your dad, okay, <laughs> for, for a period of time. It might be your mom. It may be your family. It might be your spouse. I don't know. But, but you're supposed to love those enemies. You're supposed to love those people you disagree with, those people that have different theologies. Love them with all that you have. And let's stop ripping each other apart. And then lastly, let's just live out the mission of Jesus. Let, let, let's live a life that's different than the world. Again, this is why I struggle many times with Christians because we say we're a follower of Christ and we're Christian, yet we, we're doing nothing to live out that mission to tell more and more people about who Jesus is, to see their lives change because we've been transformed. We're not perfect, all right? We're still trying. We're still working on this. But at least we're doing all we can to live out this mission, to see more and more people take their next steps with Jesus. And man, if we can do that, and even if a few of us kind of change our thinking here, even if I can be even more transformed by Jesus, our world would be a totally different place. We see more kids being adopted, more poor being taken care of, more churches planned. I mean, all this. It would, this world would be so different if we really believed that we were following Jesus and if we allowed ourselves to be transformed by Christ in our life. I hope, and if just one or two of us take these steps and begin to live this life, <laughs> incredible things will happen around us. It's true, I, I struggle like in many Christians, but I, I do that, I think, mostly because I see me in so many. But what I really want to see is me be fully transformed and, and you to be fully transformed into who Christ has created us to be and to live an incredible life because of that. I invite you to come back next week. We start a series called Weird, because we're going to talk about how weird following Jesus really is. And so I hope you'll come back as we begin that. And I hope you understand, just because I said I don't like many Christians, that doesn't mean you, okay? Um, I'll let you know if that's you, but it's not you. Um, but it is something I struggle with. But I know I need to be transformed first. And I need to love those that are different than me. And maybe that's where you are too. Let's pray. God, we um, come from different backgrounds. We, we come from different histories and different stories. And, um, and God, something has us in this place. Uh, something has influenced us enough to be here, here in this room right now or to be online uh, watching that has taken us to, to this, this church today because we, we want to be better. We, we don't want to be a carbon copy of the world. We, we want change, life change. We want transformation. And God, that only comes when we work hard to follow Jesus. And we allow your spirit to move in our lives. And so God, my prayer right now is that we would just open our hearts and our souls and our minds to your spirit moving. And that we would listen. And God, that when we struggle with being judgmental or hypocritical or, or want to fight or 
or, or, or not liking people that, that think differently than us or don't act the way that we think they should act. God, that's, that's not from you. That's from the world. Help us to love. Help us to love fully, even in our differences. Help us to love even when we struggle to love. God, help us to be Christ-like. And so, God, right now, I pray that we can be transformed by your spirit in us so the world can be a better place for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.